The prospect of mining the moon is just around the corner. So what are they so excited about? Should we be doing it at all? How would it even work? Let's explore the unexplored. The moon is just a cold, empty rock with nothing of interest but a 50-year-old American flag stuck in the ground, right? When we arrived there uh, 50, almost a little bit more than 50 years ago, uh, it's interesting to, to hear their recordings from the, uh, the second man on the moon, when he stepped out of the lunar lander and looked around, he said, this is magnificent desolation. But our view of the moon has changed radically since then, from magnificent desolation to a place that is full of important resources that we may use once we land there. Just to give you an idea of some of those, 45% of the moon is oxygen. It's just that it's tied to the rocks. These are oxidized rocks, uh, but that can be heated and you can extract plenty of oxygen. It's got 21% of silicon for anything that we do with semiconductors, iron and titanium, uh, very important elements, aluminum and calcium and magnesium and things like this, potassium and um, phosphorus. And also you find radioactive materials like uranium and thorium. Then there is uh, the possibility of, of finding um, uh, water. Water exists there and that can be a, a total game changer because water not only is good for humans, but mostly for propellant because water, you can split it into hydrogen and oxygen, uh, and, and it can serve as the most energetic propellant that, that we know. This is incredibly exciting and really does demonstrate how there are more than enough resources to maintain a permanent base. We've got metals to develop technology and oxygen for breathing. We could use moon rock to 3D print habitats and extract hydrogen to fuel deeper space exploration, which could be a big game changer. But there are actually a couple of really exciting resources that in the future could make sense to bring back to Earth. The first is energy from light. Scientists are trying to look at how we can create solar factories on the moon. Now, the problem comes with how we transport that energy back to Earth. And one way is using microwaves. We could beam them through the atmosphere, through the clouds and collect them in a receiver here on Earth which could give us enough power to supply the entire world 24 seven. This is still a long way off and doesn't make financial sense yet. But there is an element on the moon that we don't have much of here on Earth, one that could radically shake up the energy industry. One of those elements uh, is called helium-3. Helium-3 has been identified as a potential fuel for what's called fusion energy. Uh, right now, the way that we obtain uh, uh, nuclear energy on Earth is by fission. You hit an atom, you split it, and in the process, you generate energy. Fission is totally different. Here, you bring two elements, two particles, and you fuse them. And in the process of doing that, which requires a lot of energy, then a lot of energy is also released and is released in directly into electricity. You don't have to go through heating. Uh, uh, and then steam and then producing electricity. And even better, the residue is helium. Just helium, the one that, again, you can use for, for inflating balloons. So it's a non-radioactive waste uh, that you can get out of that. So it seems like mining the moon could not only serve us in space, but also provide helpful resources for us back here on Earth. But that's likely somewhere in the future. What about today? There is one resource that countries are especially interested in, and that's rare earth elements. The interest in rare earth elements has exploded because they are one of the main components of the communications industry. Neodymium is used in speakers, lanthanum in lighting, yttrium for computer screens, and gadolinium in x-rays. Despite being called rare earth, they're not actually that rare. The issue is that they're found in concentrated areas, which makes them a highly valuable bargaining chip for countries that have them within their borders. One of the countries that dominates the rare earth industry is China. Because of this, countries like the US are starting to ask questions like, well, what if China decides to restrict access to the US? Where can we get them from? The answer is, you guessed it, the moon. But would the US just be able to go up and take what they want? What are the laws for governing resources in space? The 1967 Outer Space Treaty states that no single country can claim ownership over any celestial body. But it said a little about mining. 
And because of this ambiguity, two schools of thought have developed as to how we interpret the treaty. And this has got space lawyers, yeah, space lawyers, debating the issue. So far, the international discussion has centered around two major viewpoints. Uh, the one argues since the moon belongs to everyone, it means that the resources in the moon, in the moon's subsurface, uh, whether it's water or iron or gold or platinum, belongs to everyone as well. And you can't allow a single state to say, OK, I'm going there or I allow my private sector to go there and mine it for their own commercial profit. That's the one. Uh, the one interpretation. The other interpretation says, well, it's a global commons and just like the high seas, once you are there and you do something there, part of the freedom of the high seas slash outer space, you can own it and sell it and make money with it. Uh, the, the comparison is then with the fish in the high seas. So these are the two opposing views. We still have no legal agreements amongst all the states that this is the appropriate interpretation. So we still have uh, a ways to go before all the states are on the same page. Because of this ambiguity, countries are now taking legal matters into their own hands. In 2015, the United States took the first step by saying that any company that sets up operations in the United States will have the right to access, extract, utilise and even sell resources from the moon. Not own it, but the right to access and utilise it. The following year, Luxembourg became the first European country to establish a legal framework around space resources. After that, the United Arab Emirates joined in, and most recently in 2020, so did Japan. So you're seeing how these countries are moving independently while trying to abide by the United Nations Treaty, but while finding ways to extract resources. But even if we can mine the moon, should we? That is a concern. Are we going to mine uh, the moon so much that we're going to start changing the phase that we see there? Uh, are we extract so many resources that it may affect uh, its orbit or its physical parameters? Uh, some of those concerns are understandable, uh, but it, uh, some of them shouldn't be of much concern. But in terms of, of causing major damage on the moon, I, 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 I think that that's not going to happen, at least in many, many decades or many uh, centuries. But we should start planning ahead on how to do it so that it doesn't cause a problem in the long run. So should we mine the moon? Well, if you have any interest in traveling to the moon or beyond, or potentially solving our energy crisis, then the answer may be yes, with the caveat that it's done legally and with no irreparable damage. Over the next few decades, the picture is going to start to get clearer as the moon gets busier and we find out exactly what is there and how much of it there is. When that happens, that's when things are going to get interesting. And hopefully we'll be able to find a way to share resources and avoid conflict here on Earth. <laughs>